Welcome to part 3 and the finale of my Emperor Palpatine character analysis. If you haven't seen part 1 or 2 yet, then I highly encourage you to do so. I'll throw up the title card and place a link in the description to them. In today's video, I'll continue my case for Palpatine as the greatest Star Wars character, looking at his role in the original trilogy. So without further ado, let's get into it. At the start of A New Hope, Palpatine's impact on the galaxy is clear as we see how much has changed in the 19 years since Revenge of the Sith. As visually, the Republic's environment during the prequels was more vibrant, whereas now, during the era of the Empire, everything feels more worn down or industrialized. And while Palpatine may have been Emperor in these near two decades, only now is his total conquest truly complete, with finalization of the Death Star and the termination of the Old Republic. The Imperial Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. It's a reminder that Palpatine has unlimited patience and dedication to his cause and actions, and to help facilitate making his cause a reality is Grand Moff Tarkin. Tarkin truly embodies the ideals of the Empire, and through him we see Palpatine's philosophy shine. The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. Although unfortunately for Palpatine, the idea of rule by fear, coupled with the control of the Death Star, what some consider to be the ultimate power in the universe, only generates an overconfidence in Tarkin. Should I have your ship standing by? Evacuate? In our moment of triumph? I think you overestimate their chances. And once again, a devoted follower of Palpatine suffers the same fate of failure that stemmed from their hubris. Though as the film ends, Palpatine's inevitable fate is foreshadowed. With the rebels exploiting a fatal weakness on the Death Star, and an Imperial leader's arrogance being their direct downfall. In The Empire Strikes Back, we're reminded that where Tarkin may have been Palpatine's systematic right-hand man, Vader is truly the Emperor's fist. Palpatine's ruthless nature is conveyed through Vader's rage as he hunts down the rebels that took down the Death Star. Dead set on personally pursuing them across the galaxy from the desolate ice planet of Hoth to the far reaches of space in an asteroid field. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. Move the ship out of the asteroid field so that we can send a clear transmission. And with Vader as the established fearsome villain, when even he shows unconditional obedience at the Emperor's commands, then the tone is set for the audience to fear the one man that Vader kneels to. What is thy bidding, my master? Even after all these years, Vader is still subservient to the dark side, and equally, his master. This simple question by Vader is a true display of Palpatine's eternal control over him and an example of Yoda's cautionary words. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny, consume you at will, as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice, Vader. And it's in Palpatine and Vader's conversation that we see firsthand the continued subtle manipulation that Palpatine uses on his apprentice. I have no doubt this boy is the offspring of Anakin Skywalker. As even when making this claim, Palpatine ensures to disassociate Vader from his former self, referring to Anakin in the third person, reinforcing the idea that the man in the suit was truly killed many years ago. Palpatine also refers to Luke as the offspring, rather than the son, in an attempt to show as little compassion as possible towards the boy, treating him as an object, rather than as the blood of Vader, as Vader believed that his chance at being a father died along with his late wife in Padme. Palpatine even goes as far to label him as a threat, understanding the power that the son of the Chosen One could possess. He could destroy us. He's just a boy. Obi-Wan can no longer help him. It's here that we then begin to see the compassion of Anakin Skywalker begin to resurface, as he offers to spare his son's life. If he could be turned, he would become a powerful ally. Yes. He would be a great Asset. This of course plays into Palpatine's weakness of greed and gluttony, as he attempts to bite off more than he can chew, unable to resist the temptation of potentially obtaining control over the Chosen One and his offspring. Can it be done? He will join us or die, Master. By the end of the film, the Empire does remain victorious. However, Vader failed at turning Luke over to the dark side, and remnants of Anakin are beginning to show. So for Palpatine, this means that he must take matters into his own hands. 
So at the start of The Return of the Jedi, it's made clear that Palpatine will have a more active role for the first time in the trilogy. But he asked the impossible. I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. The Emperor's coming here? The thought of Palpatine's mere presence strikes fear into the hearts of his subordinates. And if that's not enough to motivate them, Vader is used as a barometer for just how relentless Palpatine truly can be. We shall double our efforts. I hope so, Commander, for your sake. The Emperor is not as forgiving as I am. When Palpatine does arrive, the film visually conveys to us just how much fear and respect he receives from all ranks of the Empire. From the substantial amount of troopers that show up to greet him, to his apprentice that yet again kneels before him. Rise, my friend. Ironically, Palpatine refers to Vader as his friend, yet it's been decades since their relationship ever felt that way, as Vader seems hesitant to speak at times and express himself. You've done well, Lord Vader. And now I sense you wish to continue your search for young Skywalker. Yes, my master. This lack of expression comes from Palpatine's inability to show or even feign compassion over the years, as the two have become more of mutual business partners rather than the pseudo father son relationship they once shared. Patience, my friend. In time, he will see you out, and when he does, you must bring him before me. As usual, Palpatine has a plan, similar to how he once manipulated Anakin. He plans on using Luke's emotions and attachments against him. The main difference here being that he does not yet sense the conflict in Vader's heart, which will once again prove to be the deciding factor of their destiny. Only together can we turn him to the dark side of the Force. As you wish. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. On that note, history seems to be repeating itself which is why both Yoda and Obi-Wan emphasize caution to Luke about Palpatine, as they once saw the good man and Anakin fall at his hands. Do not underestimate the powers of the Emperor. Or suffer your father's fate, you will. He understands that Palpatine's greatest power isn't with the Force, rather the influence he can possess over others, as he's a master of persuasion and corruption. Bury your feelings deep down, Luke. They do you credit, but they could be made to serve the Emperor. If you give Palpatine an inch, he'll take a mile. And having seen this firsthand, even a former optimist in Obi-Wan has been turned into a skeptic, as both he and Palpatine believe that Vader could never be turned. Then the Emperor has already won. You were our only hope. As Palpatine prepares for the imminent battle versus the Rebellion, we see him lay the foundation for his trap. Send the fleet to the far side of Endor. There it will stay until called for. His plan shows his growing overconfidence as he chooses to make passive choices, all in an effort to lure the rebellion, rather than eliminating the threat as soon as possible. This idea being reinforced in his response to Vader's concerns. What of the reports of the rebel fleet massing near Sullust? It is of no concern. Soon the rebellion will be crushed and young Skywalker will be one of us. Unfortunately for Palpatine, over the years he adopted the mindset that he would always succeed, which was built off the massive success that his plan to take over the galaxy had. But he forgets that his plan worked because he considered every possibility and played both sides. Now he's put all his eggs in one basket, risking his entire life's work. And because Palpatine has become so narrow-minded, his once near omnipresent clairvoyance with the Force has been shaken. My son is with them. Are you sure? I have felt him, my master. Strange that I have not. I wonder if your feelings on this matter are clear, Lord Vader. Of course, he rationalizes this as Vader being unfocused. However, Palpatine never stops to consider that he is the one who's lost a step. He will come to me. I have foreseen it. His compassion for you will be his undoing. He will come to you, and then you will bring him before me. Once again, Palpatine plans on using a Skywalker's compassion against himself. Although just as he's lost strides in his connection with the Force, Palpatine has lost the unbreakable bond he shared with Vader, as Vader now shares it with Luke. I know there is good in you, 
The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. I feel the good in you. The conflict. There is no conflict. With Palpatine only acknowledging the evil in his son, and Luke only seeing the good in his father, the two act as the devil and angel on Vader's shoulders, setting the stage once again for him to determine the fate of the galaxy. And so, the three convene for the first time in the Emperor's throne room. It's here that Palpatine's god complex is seen visually through the throne room itself, sitting atop the tallest spire on the north pole of the most powerful superweapon, Palpatine can then look down upon the galaxy he controls, and for those that dare to enter his lair, they must ascend to him as his throne itself sits elevated relative to the singular entry point of the room. Welcome, young Skywalker. I have been expecting you. You no longer need those. Guards, leave us. To further the idea that Palpatine feels omnipotent, he shows Luke that he does not fear him, and along with that he speaks of the future as an inevitability that only he can control. I'm looking forward to completing your training. In time you will call me Master. And once again, his confidence has turned to arrogance, as he constantly speaks as if the future was already written. You will find that it is you who are mistaken about a great many things. By now you must know your father can never be turned from the dark side. So will it be with you. I assure you, we are quite safe from your friends here. So it's no surprise that to directly challenge Palpatine's arrogance is his antithesis in the humble Luke Skywalker. Your overconfidence is your weakness. Your faith in your friends is yours. This dialogue the two share epitomizes the dichotomy of the two characters perfectly, where one selfishly believes in himself, and the other selflessly maintains faith in others. This stemming from their experiences, as Luke has gained success from the help of his friends, and Palpatine has always triumphed by his own hand alone. Everything that has transpired has done so according to my design. This thought process once again shows how Palpatine believes himself to be almost godlike in nature, but in reality, he shares more similarities with God's counterpart and the devil. Even George Lucas himself has gone on record saying, Palpatine represents the devil, he represents the pure evil, the Dark Lord of the Sith who is purely out to get more power. And in the films themselves, George Lucas conveys this message through Palpatine's character traits, as one can say he's the ultimate evil, as he possesses all seven of the deadly sins. For lust, Palpatine has an intense desire to be all-powerful and an unhealthy obsession with the dark side and corrupting others, even obsessing over the idea of possessing total control over Vader but never caring for him on a personal level. For gluttony, Palpatine overindulges in the dark side, allowing it to consume him and control his actions, as he believes that he's always in control, but similar to his apprentice, his emotions control him. Even his quest for greater power both in the Force and the Empire in the latter parts of his life is unnecessary, as he already has everything the galaxy can offer, but still wants more. He still wants the son of the Chosen One. For greed, similar to gluttony and lust, Palpatine longs for materialistic possessions that he doesn't need. Not only is he already one of the most powerful people politically, but physically as well. But it's not enough for him as he feels he needs the powerful superweapon and the Death Star even though he both gained and maintained rule of the galaxy without it. For Sloth, Palpatine never had this trait early on in his quest for power. However, as he gained that power, he became sedentary and complacent, delegating tasks to those such as Tarkin and Vader. It wasn't until Return of the Jedi that he decided to take matters into his own hands, and even then, it was too late as he seemed to have lost a step in his connection with Vader and the Force. For Wrath, Palpatine believes that feelings of anger and hate are supreme, always instigating violence caused by others and himself. He seeks to exact revenge on the rebels and Jedi alike, fueled by his rage to eliminate them once and for all. For Envy, it could be said that Palpatine was jealous of Anakin's unlimited potential, and more importantly, of the Jedi as a whole, as in his eyes they possessed the power he craved in the Chosen One, so he decided to take him for himself. And finally, pride, the sin that defines Palpatine the most, as he has such an overwhelming abundance of confidence in his mind and his abilities that it would prove to be his downfall. 
Ironically, his pride turned him into the very thing he despises in the Jedi of the Republic era, as both he and the Council became arrogant, blind, and dogmatic over the years. Pride could be seen as the root cause of all the other sins, as he believed that he was better than everyone else and wanted to prove it at all costs, corrupting the best of the Jedi along the way. Which brings us back to his attempt to seduce and corrupt the young Luke Skywalker, inching him closer to the dark side. Take your Jedi weapon. Use it. I am unarmed. Strike me down with it. Give in to your anger. With each passing moment, you make yourself more my servant. As he once did with Anakin, Palpatine now attempts to use Luke's emotions against himself, understanding that Luke has too much compassion for his friends to stand by and remain idle. It is unavoidable. It is your destiny. You, like your father, are now mine. As Luke burns with rage, Palpatine's final plan is beginning to come to fruition. As he's at the cusp of controlling Luke as he once did Vader, he pins Luke in a no-win scenario to either do nothing and lose everything and everyone you fight for, or to fight and lose everything that you stand for. In the simplest terms, it's a trap. Not only has Palpatine fabricated a trap for Luke to succumb to the dark side, but for the rebel fleet and those on the forest moon of Endor. I'm afraid the deflector shield will be quite operational when your friends arrive. Your fleet is lost, and your friends on the Endor moon will not survive. There is no escape, my young apprentice. And with these paralleling events, the rebellion seems all but finished, so Luke's emotions are at an all-time high leaving Palpatine ready to give Luke just enough of a push to descend him into the madness. I can feel your anger. I am defenseless. Take your weapon. Strike me down with all of your hatred, and your journey towards the dark side will be complete. And so, like father like son, Luke takes the bait and embraces his anger, with Vader and Luke now fighting for the fate of the galaxy. And as the fight begins, Palpatine couldn't be more pleased with the results. Good. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. While Luke is hesitantly beginning to show signs of embracing the dark side, unfortunately for Palpatine, Vader shows signs of inner conflict. Your thoughts betray you, father. I feel the good in you. The conflict. There is no conflict. So as his apprentice begins to slip, Palpatine embraces the idea of history repeating itself, where a young Skywalker is given the opportunity to dethrone his current apprentice. But when the duel of Anakin vs Dooku and Luke vs Vader truly start to mirror each other is when Vader suggests that Leia could be turned. If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. This has Luke go over the edge, as he relentlessly uses the force for attack rather than defense, to the point that he disarms his father and defeats him. Your hate has made you powerful. Now, fulfill your destiny and take your father's place at my side. With Palpatine's victory all but complete, the unexpected happens. Luke realizes that he has become the very thing he swore to destroy, an agent of evil symbolized through the eternal scar that both Vader and he share in their mechanical hands, a reminder that Vader and he are not all that different, and that he could lose his humanity, as Anakin once did, this highlighting the impact that Palpatine has on influencing others and changing their very essence. As author Amanda Hawking once stated, when you dance with the devil, the devil doesn't change, the devil changes you. So to Palpatine's disappointment, Luke decides to break the chain once and for all. You failed your highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. With his apprentice failing and his new prodigy rejecting him entirely, Palpatine simply replies with pure disdain in his voice. So be it, Jedi. Palpatine failed to break Luke's spirit, so instead, he chooses to break his body. If you will not be turned, you will be destroyed. Only now, 
at the end. Do you understand? Ironically, it's Palpatine who still fails to understand, as he's forgotten the importance of compassion. Now, as he harms the life of Luke, he threatens the very symbol of hope for Anakin, as Luke not only is the very person that shares his blood, but he's the living embodiment of Padme's compassion. Where Vader feels love from his son, he receives indifference from Palpatine. Now, young Skywalker, you will die. So in the same way Anakin chose Palpatine over Mace all those years ago to save someone he loved, he does the same again, this time choosing his son. And as Palpatine is destroyed, his failure is now complete. His pride led him to believe that he could never be defeated, and that Vader could never be turned. Ironically, Vader adhered to the way of the Sith by betraying the Master when he no longer needed him. Only in this case, rather than taking his instructor's place, his actions reaffirms the rebirth of Anakin Skywalker. It's also fitting that Palpatine's life ends in the Death Star, the symbol of his life's work, as he spent decades plotting and scheming to create this ultimate weapon, only to be killed by it in the end. As per the Sith, Palpatine's hubris was the cause of his downfall, and the sins and atrocities he committed finally caught up to him. Similar to Leia's line in A New Hope, the more he tightened his grip, the more others slipped through his fingers which can be seen in the creation of the Rebellion and the return of Anakin Skywalker. Across the galaxy, the people cheer, including his home planet of Naboo, as the ruler that chose to be feared rather than loved is gone. Palpatine is the epitome of the Sith itself and the embodiment of the Devil. His story reminds us that anyone can be seduced by the dark side, as evil is everywhere, but also that anyone can be saved given a second chance. You can have all the power in the world, physically or even politically, but you will truly never have control over others, as they will always have the power of choice. Palpatine also shows that we can accomplish anything we set our minds to with patience, perseverance, and hard work, as having these qualities will always lend themselves to success. But most of all, Palpatine brings the fun into being a villain, as there's never a dull moment around him, as he uses his charm, intelligence, adaptability, and power to be a formidable antagonist to the many heroes of Star Wars, challenging them physically, mentally, and emotionally. A clear reminder that a hero is only as good as his villain. It's because of this, and so much more, that Palpatine has forever earned a special place in the hearts of audiences as the ultimate villain and the greatest Star Wars character of all time. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I had a ton of fun making this video, so if you enjoyed it too, then I highly suggest liking the video. And if you want to see more like it, then definitely hit subscribe. And if you want to be notified when the next character analysis comes out, then hit the bell for notifications. Also, I want to give a shout out to my patrons. Your support means everything to me. If you enjoy the content and want to help support the channel, then check out the Patreon link in the description. Any contribution would help out immensely. Also, let me know in the comments which Star Wars character is the most important to the story and why. And who knows, they might be in the next one. Until next time, go out and fulfill your destiny.